a historic agreement to address a critical shortage of water in the Middle East. It's being sold as a benefit to all, but it's opened the floodgates to a wave of accusations and recriminations. We dip below the surface and ask what's at stake and who stands to gain? This is Inside Story. Hello there and a warm welcome to the programme. I'm Shuli Ghosh. Now, it's been sold as a rare example of regional cooperation, a deal between Israeli, Palestinian and Jordanian ministers to provide new sources of water for the three neighbours and maybe save the Dead Sea along the way. But it's a deal swirling with political, environmental and moral undercurrents. Let's take a look at it. The new project would provide a desalination plant on the northern tip of the Red Sea in Aqaba, that will provide Jordan and Israel with a new source of drinking water and allow Israel to sell desalinated water for use in the occupied West Bank. A later phase could see a 180 kilometre pipeline to carry brine from the desalination plant on the Red Sea to the Dead Sea. The idea is to replenish the Dead Sea, which is declining at a metre a year. Well, ministers signing the agreement at the World Bank in Washington were unanimous in their praise for the project. We are joining hands with our regional partners to develop such an important project, which I think will be a model, not only for our region, but to the whole world where we have conflict and hostilities. We're living and we're sharing, despite the problem that uh, we, uh, we do have, uh, but also we're sharing also the, uh, uh, the, the problem that comes from the scarcity of water. Uh, today we showed that uh, we can work together in terms of making more water available. Let's hope that that agreement will be a glimmer of hope for, uh, let's say, future agreements for comprehensive peace uh, in the region. Well, we'll introduce our guests in just a moment. But first, Simon McGregor Wood has more on this for Inside Story from the Dead Sea in Jordan. The politicians on all sides of this deal are making some pretty bold claims about the benefits and clearly there is a, a strategic breakthrough if you like but principally I think at the level of the politics of water. People in Jordan, people in southern Israel and of course people in the occupied West Bank are desperately short of water. They need more both for drinking and for farming and this deal will deliver significant increases in supplies but I think the problem from the environmental point of view and from the skeptical point of view is that the politicians are also making some pretty grand claims that the deal will also address the well the frankly the, the, the disaster that is the Dead Sea today and the skeptics are saying well the numbers simply don't back up those claims this Dead Sea problem translates into a meter lost in level every year according to environmentalists that's 800 million cubic meters lost every year. Now the best case scenario under this deal is that the, the Dead Sea would receive only 100 million cubic meters from the Red Sea and the, and the desalination works every year. And that, well, it, it's simply not enough to even address the falling levels. The environmentalists say the only way to get to grips with this problem is to stop people taking water out of the Jordan River, which is the Dead Sea's natural supply. And for years, the Jordan has been overextracted by Israel, Jordan and Syria. And until that problem is addressed, the Dead Sea is in real trouble and for a long time to come. And the deal signed yesterday in Washington makes for some nice headlines, some good PR for sure, but it's about the politics of water, it's about human consumption, it's not about saving the Dead Sea. I'm Simon McGregor Wood for Inside Story by the shores of the Dead Sea. Well, let's introduce today's guests in Amman in Jordan, Munketh Meya, Chairman of Friends of the Earth Middle East and Director of its Amman office. Joining us from Rehovot, south of Tel Aviv, is Jerusalem Post journalist Sharon Udassin, who specializes in the environment, energy and water. 
And in Norwich in the UK is Mark Zaytoun, a reader at the School of International Development at the University of East Anglia and director of the university's Water Security Research Centre. Uh, good to have all of you with us. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, Sharon, let me start with you. Um, it, as simply as an agreement to get more water to consumers, this is being heralded as a, a, a great agreement. It demonstrates how all sides can cooperate with each other. Is that how it's being seen in Israel? Yes, in general, um, it is being viewed exactly that way in Israel, uh, especially by Energy and Water Minister Silvan Shalom, who yesterday exactly called it a historic agreement. Um, while there are definitely are critics on certain levels, uh, from, from just a geopolitical perspective, this is perceived as a, a positive agreement, one that will bring about water sharing and swaps in a region that is really starved for water. Uh, and uh, Munketh, it, it is a fact that these countries do need water. How badly is the water shortage situation in this region? Well, uh, it's a well-known fact uh, that uh, the uh, whole region is suffering. But uh, if we look at each country by itself, we find that Israel living a very relaxed timing because with the desalination uh, plants that they did on the uh, Mediterranean, they have an abundant uh, uh, extra water in their water economy. Uh, in Jordan, we have shortage of uh, 450 uh, million cubic meters. Uh, also, the DC uh, project uh, made it a bit uh, bearable uh, uh, this summer. Uh, but we all know that the uh, Palestine, uh, who is suffering uh, the most, not being able to control any kind of resources, not even the aquifers uh, in the mountain aquifer under their feet. So uh, the region, uh, it's, uh, it's not all the same. Israel is relaxed in the water economy, and the two uh, other countries are in trouble, in my opinion. Mark, do you agree with that? Um, Israel is very, very worried about, uh, well, it, it's doing more about water security uh, than uh, other countries are doing. It's invested millions in desalination projects. Yeah, certainly the disparity that Munkath mentioned is, is there. Uh, but the Israeli desalination production, which is five or six times more than this project is going to build, uh, should be understood in the light of why the Dead Sea is dying in the first place and whether the benefits of this new project will be distributed equitably. Because essentially there's no water security without equitable sharing or equitable or water security for all, in fact. So it's the, the big question is how will this new water that's produced be distributed? And if we look back at the process that brought us to this point, we have some indications that, uh, that it won't be distributed equitably. Well, so but let, let's look at the agreement in, in, in more detail because, uh, as I understand it, um, the, this agreement will allow Israel to sell more desalinated water to the Palestinians. But the, the key word is sell. Um, and actually, the Palestinians uh, presumably would prefer to have access to uh, fresh river water. So why would they, why would they enter into this agreement? Good question. I think if you look at the reaction, there are people in all of the countries actually are opposing it. In Jordan, as Munkath can explain, and in Israel, environmentalists. And in, in the West Bank, Palestinian NGOs just last month released a statement against this project precisely because it undermines Palestinian water rights. So they're advocating for their rights uh, not to purchase water as a consumer. Yeah, well, let's look back at that, uh, that statement made by NGOs. Uh, as Mark says, in October, more than 20 non-governmental organizations called on the Palestinian Authority to reject this deal. They say the project undermines Palestinian water rights and legitimizes Palestinian dispossession from the Jordan River. Instead of being able to access the fresh river water, Palestinians will be sold desalinated water at a high cost. The group say the plan doesn't address damage to the West Bank Eastern Aquifer. Currently, the Palestinians' only source of water 
And far from saving the Dead Sea, they say adding brine produced in the desalination plant will destroy its ecosystem. And the NGOs say the World Bank's studies of the project lacked credibility and transparency. Uh, Sharon, let's just come back to you. Let me get your response to, uh, to this. The Palestinian NGO statement, um, which says that this project undermines Palestinian water rights. It legitimizes Palestinian dispossession from the Jordan River. What do you say to that? Well, first and foremost, I don't really think that it is relevant to the, the Jordan River right now because the Jordan River is, is not being used at, at all by, by anyone. And even um, if it is it's very polluted right now, and even if anyone had access to it, no one would be able to use it. This project focuses on water coming from the Red Sea um, and being traded with water from Lake Kinneret. So I, I just don't see the relevance. I think these pal the Palestinian protests were to a much larger project that had been discussed for many years, a $10 billion project that was going to have many, many more regional implications. Not that this one doesn't, but I, I think their protests were honestly to, to something different and not to the deal which was signed yesterday, uh, which was a much smaller version of a larger deal. Munketh, when we look at those protests by Palestinian NGOs, what do you think of their criticism of the deal, that it, it legitimizes Israel's water theft of the River Jordan? Okay. Because, I mean, Israel has unilateral control of that uh, on the uh, upper reaches of, of the course. river, doesn't it? Uh, of course, yeah. L let's get one thing straight before we uh, go any further, in my opinion. The project that we are looking at today, which called a historical moment, is nothing more than a desalination project at the north of the city of Aqaba, 18 kilometers to be precise. That makes it a very ordinary desalination plant with the plans to take the brine to the Red Sea, 45 kilometers south to the Saudi border. Now, in your opening, you said that a proposed pipe to take the brine all the way to the Dead Sea. And yes, it is a proposed, because that pipe must pass the environmental impact assessment studies and also the economic uh, studies. Yeah, that, that and pipe both wasn't are part done of yet. Monday's agreement, but it's certainly a project that's been thought about for a long time, isn't it? It, it is, and let's remember that the World Bank study, or the study that led by the World Bank conducted about a year ago, the results came out negative. It's, it has a negative impact environmentally, and it's not uh, uh, economically feasible. So to be specific, uh, dumping lots of brine, yeah. which is a byproduct of desalination, into the Dead Sea, uh -huh. in your opinion, could be ecologically damaging to the Dead Sea. Exactly. Now, uh, uh, having said that, we go back to the uh, Jordan River. And yes, Israel been enjoying taking the, uh, the lion's share of the Jordan River water for a long, long time. Uh, it was uh, the time at war where everybody used to grab as much as they want, because I don't want to let this, w this water go to uh, my enemy. So I take whatever I can. In 1995, we struck a, a uh, agreement with uh, Jordan and Israel, uh, uh, allowing Jordanians about 250 million cubic meters from the waters of the Yarmouk and the Jordan uh, River. Now, uh, if we go back a bit in history and look at Johnston plan in the uh, mid-50s, uh, Jordan and the West Bank at that time had a share of 830 million, but now Jordan is getting only 250, leaving the share of the Palestinians with the Israelis. And now, as I understand uh, uh, it, the, the over excessive use of the River Jordan is exactly why the Dead Sea is diminishing. Of course, Yanni, the Jordan River used to bring 1.3 billion cubic meters to the uh, Dead Sea. Today, it's not bringing more than uh, 70 to 100 million cubic meters 
uh, depending on the uh, rainy season. That means that between eight, uh, 96 and 98 percent of the river's water been diverted. Uh, and that is definitely not sustainable for the region. Now, uh, the way we look at it, when they conducted the World Bank studies, we forced the, the, the World Bank at that time to go ahead and do alternative study for the Red Dead, the, the mega project, the Red Dead Canal. And uh, the, the studies conducted by three experts from the three countries, and they came up with a, 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 um, a way that uh, they can rehabilitate the Jordan River. We need to look at rehabilitating the water economy in all three countries and to look more into reuse of the water that we have already. Only okay, then we let, can let me bring able... Sharon in from uh, Israel mm. because, Sharon, the, one of the main criticisms uh, of this is that Israel um, is controlling access to the River Jordan, uh, is uh, using a lot of that water for uh, irrigation, for agricultural needs, and, and ironically, that is why there is a need for a desalination plant in the first place. Honestly, in terms of agriculture, um, Israel is making a huge use of um, treated wastewater and not the River Jordan um, in order to water agriculture. I mean, I think that there are three countries who have been responsible for really um, taking water from the River Jordan, and that would be um, Israel, uh, that would be Jordan, and that would also be Syria because um, the river has sources um, in, in Syria. Mark, let me come to you. There seems to be two problems with this deal. Um, first of all, whether the desalination plant is the, is the right way to go, uh, given that it means that we end up selling desalinated water back to the Palestinians um, instead of perhaps giving them access uh, to uh, the River Jordan. And secondly, this whole idea of putting brine into the Dead Sea, which may or may not happen at some point in the future, actually could be an environmental disaster. Right, so you, you've said it well. I mean, there are envir serious environmental and social concerns. The environmental issues are not just how the, the composition of the Dead Sea water changes, uh, but also if that seawater, when it's transmitted tr down to the Dead Sea, if it begins to contaminate the underground aquifer water um, and if you're interested in the environmental issues you would also be concerned about the, um, the intake structure of the desalination plant at the Red Sea and as uh, Munketh Mayer discussed then this more serious concerns are the, the bigger environmental uh, impact that could be made positive impact would be restoration of the Jordan River which is a natural breathing system with much greater biodiversity. The social impacts, as you mentioned, it's, uh, the, this is a process between three countries, two of which are at peace with each other, and one, uh, two of which are, one is occupied by the other, and that's the West Bank. If you look at the process that got us to an earlier version of this project over the last seven years, you can get an idea of just how equitable this deal, this new deal will be and uh, whether it will be fair or not. During the process, uh, Israel continued to deny Palestinian requests for access to the Dead Sea. Even though the Dead Sea is partly on the West Bank, Palestinians don't have access to it. That access is continuing to be denied, even over the six or seven years of consultations. Do you think that's one Plus, reason why they entered into this agreement? Because they think that maybe one day, if there is an eventual peace accord, um, this needs to be uh, uh, an asset that they have to have a foothold in and, and uh, 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 an interest in now. I suppose so. I mean, each actor is in it for their own state, for their own interests, and the Palestinians stand to gain possible access to the Dead Sea and the development of industry there and tourism, like Jordan and Israel have done. The other interest for Palestinians is uh, water. So if there is a fair share of water that comes out of it, it could be a good idea for some Palestinians. But, what but when you, you look at the opposition in, in each country, 
it's, it's unanimous, uh, it, mostly on environmental grounds and, and also on the social grounds. It's interesting that, that you know, this agreement was sound, signed at the World Bank headquarters, so uh, clearly the World Bank is endorsing it as a deal. John Kerry um, is, is due in Jerusalem. Uh, he says this is a good deal because it, it, it improves economic development. Does a project like this have any impact on future peace talks negotiations? Well, I think it, it has positive impact on the businesses in the region, in the Dead Sea, so the potash industry and tourism. Whether you think that's going to lead to peace or not is, is, a, is up for you to decide. If you look at the process that's been up until this point, it's been one mainly of uh, distance, the governments distancing themselves from the people's concerns and the governments within themselves uh, fighting and battling, denying Israel, denying access to the Dead Sea of Palestinians. And I'd like to point out that what you, you noted that the, the root cause of all this is upstream water use, so damming of the Lake of Tiberias in 1964 by Israel, and then later dams uh, by Jordan and Syria on the Yarmouk River. All that water that's been used up until very recently has been, to, a lot of it has been used to grow crops in the desert, bananas in the desert on the Jordanian side, and dates and what have you on the Israeli side. The question then becomes if there's so much local mismanagement that the Dead Sea is dying, why do we need the desalination plant to rescue us? And indeed, why should the international community and the World Bank pay for local mismanagement to the tune of billions of dollars? It's a question that, that needs to be answered before we proceed. Do you, do you agree with that, uh, Munketh, that there, there, could, there should be better management of water resources on a local level, better management of, of wastewater, um, rather than automatically building desalination plants, uh, which will automatically increase people's consumption and keep having a knock-on effect down the line? Absolutely, I agree, Annie. The uh, reform of the water uh, sector in uh, in all countries is very, very much needed. But um, I would say that we should leave the desalination option to the last. And since our governments are excited about having a desalination plant, I, I do not oppose it, really. And especially when we see a historic agreement with the three countries on board discussing a, 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 such a project in the open. I want to see cooperation between the three countries on water issues. This is something we do support Annie, in the open also. Now, look at the project itself now. The project talks about desalinating in the south and to supply Elat with a certain amount of water to be exchanged from water in the north for Jordan, where Jordan needs it most. At the same time, I find it good from the Jordanians to include the Palestinians and ask Israel to supply the West Bank with more water. I think this whole formula is an excellent one. We do not oppose it, and we think that's what the region is needed. Okay, well, this is a key question, together. isn't it? Let's, now, let's let but, me just ask Sharon but, this one Yanni, question, if, because uh, a lot of this hinges on whether Israel is going to supply um, the West Bank with more water, because it's certainly not uh, a condition, is it, where, that they make more water available? It's an option that they could make more water available to sell at a high price to the Palestinians. Is that the case, Sharon? Well, I, I was under the assumption that it was a condition of this agreement. I mean, this was just a memorandum of understanding, but I assume um, once the parties uh, formalize it more than a memorandum of understanding, that it will be something that they commit to. I mean, already Israel is required by the Oslo Accords um, to supply directly uh, 31 uh, million cubic meters a year of water to the Palestinian Authority, and they're currently supplying directly 52. This is in addition to the 196 million cubic meters a year um, <clears throat> that the Palestinians receive um, from from the region, from the aquifer. Um, and I, I don't see any reason why Israel would go back on a commitment. I, um, there's no reason 
I, I think that they will follow through with this. Let me say a big thank you to today's guests, Munketh Mayer and Mark Zaytoun. And with us on the phone, Sharon Udassin. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. We always welcome your comments, so feel free to tweet us. Our Twitter name is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Shudi Ghosh. Bye for now. <laughs>